Hello, welcome back to COG 266, Brains, Minds, and Consciousness. Today, we're going to talk about neurotransmitters. So last time we talked about the um, sort of the mechanisms of how one neuron, one cell, can propagate a signal across itself. We'll, we'll recap that shortly. Today, we're going to talk about where that signal comes from and where that signal goes to and how that happens. So first of all, one very important concept here is that it's all about communication. Everything we're talking about is actually communication, right? So the cells are doing it a certain way. They're using biology, they're using ions, but what they're doing is communicating information. So when we're communicating ever, you know, normal human communication, we might be doing different things, right? Like trying to organize something. Janelle and I will head out there around six, seeking action from elsewhere. Hey, pull the fire alarm, trying to get information back. So where, where we're going to meet, you know, all those things are passing a message from one person to another and sometimes hoping to get something back in return. But that's the idea. We are moving information around, right? We happen to typically use our mouths, blah, 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 open, flap open, and make the meat vibrate until you can hear it through the airwaves, right? But we also use text. We also use uh, all kinds of other ways to transmit information. So even down to the cellular level, that's what we're doing. So internal communication for a neuron is the action potential, which we already covered. So let's recap it because I know there was a lot in that last, uh, last, last lecture. So let's, let's pin it down a little better. <clears throat> so we've seen how this happens, right? Incoming signals from the synapse will hit the dendrites. Uh, and then a, the potential, the charge builds up in the cell body. Once it crosses a certain threshold of being charged enough, this will cause protein pumps in the cell mem membrane near the axon, right, um, to pull a lot of in ions in and release, release ions out, which will then destabilize the next axon um, membrane segment and the next and the next and the next, causing this cascade all the way down to the end of the axon. And then somehow the signal that we've sent will jump to another cell, right? So... Just watching the propagation. Um, this is how this, this impulse, the action potential, will move across the cell membrane of the axon, right? So remember, there's ions inside, ions outside, positive and negative charges, and they will flow in when the channel, channels open, which will cause the next channels to open, which will cause the next channels to open, and so on, until we get down to the end of the cell. Uh, a little faster because we, it's important to recognize that this like this is fast, right? And this is like way, 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 not even remotely as fast as it could be. Um, and in fact, there is a way to speed this up, right? So, so this is the this is the the way that the signal will naturally flow with no aid on top of it. Just a reminder that we can go faster than this. So the myelin sheath that you see on the outside of some cells some neurons help to make this signal go faster. The basic idea is that it reduces the number of points of contact, uh, so to speak, with being able for exchanging ions in and out of the cell. So if an action potential has to make fewer stops, then the change in charges can move a little more quickly. So here's an example of, <laughs> I like this metaphor I found, it's stepping on a balloon is a good way to think about um, the way the action potential moves, right? So for an unmyelinated neuron, we step on it and it sends a signal straight down, right? It has, to, it has to hit every segment, right? Every bit of membrane activates the next bit of membrane. With some banding in place, some, some myelination, instead, everything's allowed to flow a little bit more directly from stop to stop. Now, there are issues with, you know, it has to build up enough to, to send the signal further. But remember, the strength of the signal doesn't matter so much. So um, this is just to illustrate. Uh, don't focus too much on this. This was cribbed from another, another lecture. But the general idea is that 
your a myelinated neuron is going to be able to cause that cascade, it's going to be faster. It's going to have fewer stops, so it's going to jump more quickly, which is great for human brains where we have a lot of long distance communication happening. We're trying to make the neuron from one area of the brain reach all the way over to a neuron in a different area sometimes. Myelination helps to make that possible without us being very slow witted, honestly. So the basics, action potentials, as we've covered them, it's this ionic change in the cell that causes it to send this information, right? Some signal has happened, something has changed. Uh, across its body based on what it's getting from elsewhere. So great. We're seeing how this works within a cell, but then the question, you know, the big question of this lecture is where do those signals come from and where do they end up going? Um, and just to kind of illustrate, this was the kind of the best I could find of, of watching some neurons in real time. These are some neurons firing in a hippocampus. It's a little blurry, so just poke your head in for a minute. And it's very slowed down and everything, but these are all different cells. And, and what we're recording here is the electrical activity or the differentials in electric, electrical activity. We'll talk a little more about electricity in quotes, in air quotes I'm putting, uh, versus what we're actually measuring here, uh, here at the end. But this is neural activity. The neurons are sending information to nearby neurons, which then will collect enough charge to, to spike and send information elsewhere. In fact, I want to I want to play it again. Uh, yeah, I have the control to do that. It's just interesting to watch. It's a very organic process, right? But ultimately, it's kind of like ones and zeros. It's information, right? We're moving things, moving some kind of signal through the web of all the networks of all the neurons that are activating each other causing our complex, rich, internal life, right? So, the, the question at hand is, okay, cool. I, I kind of get how the ions flow in and out of a single cell. What the heck happens at the end and the beginning? So, for neurons to send information across the synapse, you know, the connection between neurons, we need neurotransmitters. And here's a little sketchy thing just to, to illustrate that. So. Every individual neuron has its own processes going on, and it is also able to catch and send neurotransmitters. So this is where we get to the idea of messaging forward, right? Uh, so when the action potential reaches the axon terminal at the end of itself, right? So terminal just means end, right? What happens is little bubbles called vesicles containing neurotransmitters, so they, they have these weird proteins and, and, and such in them. Um, oh, that's more than just proteins. We'll, we'll talk in a minute. Uh, are activated, kind of like the protein pumps, right? So, so it's not the same. It's not just sending out ions. It's sending out whole, like, bubbles full of stuff. So these bubbles emit the neurotransmitters out into the synaptic cleft. So that is the, the area, the, the missing space between the two neurons, i.e. the synapse, where, where it's sitting. We'll look at a diagram briefly uh, in, in a minute. So, uh, which then the next cell receives, and we kind of already know how this part works. The next cell will then open ion channels because, not, so not based on its own membrane potential, but because a neurotransmitter hit it, right? Allowing new ions to flow into the cell and change its charge and thus do all the things we've already talked about, right? So let's look at this. Here we have two neurons. On the left, we have a presynaptic neuron, and on the right, we have a postsynaptic neuron, i.e. the neuron that is b before the synapse and the one that is coming after the synapse. Then we have the synaptic cleft, right? So the axon of the, of the presynaptic neuron, the signal gets to the end and it causes these vesicles to go out to the edge. Um, you know, cell, cell membranes are weird. Uh, so a bubble moves to the edge and pops out neurotransmitters, which will then be caught by the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron. And we'll, we'll zoom in on that in a minute. And so those messages hit the surface of the membrane of the, of the dendrite 
and that causes the channel to open and the ions flow and we already kind of know what happens after that, right? The signal will accumulate and maybe this cell will fire or maybe it won't. This is the basic interaction. So yeah, the way that, uh, the way that it, it's pretty, it's like the ancient thing, right? Being able to spit out things that another cell can pick up. We saw that that was one of the very first things evolved and that's what we do. That's how the neurons communicate with each other. They are still at the end of the day, just cells, but they're doing it in a very clever, weird, super fancy way. So that's the basic interaction for a neurotransmitter. Signal hits the end of the axon, bang, something is released between the two and hopefully the next one catches it. It always, almost always does, but there are ways that it does not. And we'll talk about those as well. So neurotransmitters, right? These are, they activate the receptors on the protein channels of the postsynaptic cells, causing the ions to flow in and out. Very similar situation to, um, to, to the way that the membrane will itself be triggered by the, by the signals inside the cell. Um, and these can be both excitatory and inhibitory. Uh, so they can say, hey, stop, uh, stop doing this thing. Those typically won't hit the dendrites. They'll more kind of go towards the cell body. Um, but that's just a small wrinkle. Just knowing that neurotransmitters can both tell a cell to, hey, open up, do more, do more flow. Or they can say, hey, don't, hey, stop opening up. Uh, don't, please don't, <laughs> right? Uh, the way, and that just has to do with the way that the neurotransmitter hits the, the receptacle of the, the, the node that opens the pump. So this is quick. This is quick stuff. Less than, less than half a millisecond. Half a millisecond. That's, that's very small. Um, you know, a thousand milliseconds in a second. So one in one two thousandth of a second, right? And the effects are short term. So, so this is not something that is going, you know, the neurotransmitter hitting a cell it's a, it's a blip, right? It's, it's there long enough to, to make the channel open and then it's spit back out into, into the wild, right? So this is not like the cell is accumulating a lot of neurotransmitter. It's just, oh, something, something hit me and that caused me to, to trigger, to, to do something else, right? To change the ion flow of myself. Once it gets it, it's kind of done. So just to, to, re-illustrate this all on one slide. So we have this whole scenario of, of the axon ends, the, the bubbles, the vesicles spit out the neurotransmitter and they are caught by the next one. So the idea behind this is that some pumps on the surface, on the membrane of, of neurons have this neurotransmitter slot, right? And when the right transmitter hits that slot, the channel will open causing ions to flow. This channel, this slot will be sensitive to different kinds of neurotransmitters. So different cells can have things that are sensitive to different kinds. And we'll, we'll talk about what those are soon. Um, so, and, and then ultimately what that does is it causes a charge to build up in the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron. Now, lots of axons might hit the same set of dendrites. You know, it can be many to one, it can be one to many. Uh, there, there's a lot of ways to connect neurons in the brain, but this is the basic interaction between them. So, okay, this is cool. It seems like a wasteful prospect. I, I have to dump chemicals out into the, into the void to ho and hope that the next cell catches them. Huh? So what, what happens to neurotransmitters? Neurotransmitters are recovered by the, by the cells that emitted them typically. Uh, so this is the big question. Are they, are they spent? Is it, is it waste? Are they, are they dead? Oh my gosh. Here's what happens. The vesicles that originally released this, the neurotransmitter will return to the cell body, just kind of become another bubble, right? They, they were on the surface for a moment to spit the neurotransmitter out, and then they will kind of blob back into the end of the, the axon. New vesicles will form, which contain neurotransmitters from two different sources. Either there are reuptake channels at the end of this neuron in, in the axon um, that can help take things back from the cleft, right? It can kind of vacuum up loose neurotransmitter that has, it's done its job uh, and we need to just pull it back in if we can, if we can get it. 
or the cell will reabsorb neurotransmitter components that were broken down by enzymes in the cleft and it'll make make new ones on its own so it can either take fully re you know recaptured ones or it'll take bits of them and build its its own new ones so here's a um a diagram of this process so okay uh let's look at number one on the on the right there one is a full neurotransmitter vesicle it's happy to it's, it's like ready to to launch so the signal comes down the the action potential comes down and says yo get out there so it goes to the surface of the membrane there at step step two and it dumps the neurotransmitter into the cleft now the next cell down there at the bottom will catch it and say oh uh, I'll, I'll do some stuff with this but now at step three there are some reuptake channels right um and, and those will pull the neurotransmitter back into the cell and it will get loaded in a little later at step five um but otherwise at steps three and sorry at step four this is showing how the vesicle has has it sort of pulls back into the cell body and what's not super pictured here is that this is also the step at which the cell might generate new ones right so the the vesicle brings in some of the enzymes that might be useful for rebuilding or sorry the, the some of the neurotransmitter components that were degraded by enzymes that will be useful for rebuilding them okay so I hope this now makes sense. This is this is it's such a weird thing, and it's happening extremely fast inside your brain. And, you know, you think about oh, neurons are firing, bang, 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 like lots of times per per second. Yeah, that's how fast these little bits and bobs of of particles of chemicals it, at the cellular level they're moving that fast. They're doing stuff fast. They are. Every time you have a thought, bang, m millions and billions of neurotransmitter particles are just launched all, all between the clefts of your neurons in your brain. That's just happening to you right now. It's happening. It's crazy. Always happening all the time. <laughs> okay, so that's neurotransmitter um, activating the next cell. There are actually two kinds of chemicals, though, uh, and I've sort of juked you by by having us just talk about neurotransmitters because there's also a thing called neuromodulators uh, so while neurotransmitters will excite or inhibit activations in nearby cells neuromodulators can alter the properties of nearby cells Ooh, that's a lot How, what do we mean by that so neuromodulators these are going to activate receptors similar to the neurotransmitter but it's not on an ion pump it's not on you know the, our classic oh i will now figure out how to how to change things here um it's on it's on a, a receptor that has an enzymatic reaction in the next neuron so this means that essentially we're, we're triggering the next neuron to start manufacturing something different proteins inside the cell not about ion flow. It's about, hey, make some of this, do this. So it can change a lot of things about how that next cell works. Um, so they, they can change the protein pumps, so how sensitive they are. Um, it can change the expression of genes in the nucleus and affect other synapses. So the neuromodulators are powerful. They're, they're more complex and they're more interesting. I mean, not that the neurotransmitters aren't interesting themselves. I just mean they are more, there's nuance and oddity to them. These are slower. So these aren't going to be the things that are pump, pump, pumping away uh, as our normal way of communicating. These are things that might cause changes across the cells, might change slowly. Things may be associated with things like mood, right? Um, or, or general attitudes. We'll, we'll see how that works in, in um, some dysfunctional things like uh, depression or anxiety in the future uh so these are slow and they're long term it might take seconds or minutes they might last seconds or minutes they could last longer so that's the idea so in the neuromodulatory synapse basic mechanics are similar to the neurotransmitter transmitter stuff there's vesicles release reuptake receptor sites etc the difference is that based on the how, the difference is that the, the postsynaptic neuron behave, does some different stuff here. So let's cover it. Uh, here's an example. One receptor on the, on the postsynaptic neuron activates G proteins 
the sort of cellular switch uh, in, in a lot of enzyme reactions. Here, it's going to activate adenylate cy cyclase. I, I screw this up every time. Uh, which converts ATP into CAMP, producing a kinase. What the heck am I talking about? So protein kinase A, PKA, causes a major effect in the next cell. Essentially, it's changing the gene expression, altering the protein channel activity, basically making it behave differently at the, at the highest level. That's what matters most here. Uh, and so that's why I said this slide, wait, what? Um, we're trying to focus less on the specific protein. That was just an example. Just be aware of the action, right? So the release of a neuromodulator causes a chain reaction of elements that alter the neuron's long-term behavior. Now, long-term has various meanings here. It could be over the course of a few seconds. It could be over the course of a few minutes. Hours sometimes, maybe, depending, you know. Um, it all depends on on what, what the cell's in specific interactions are doing. Uh, but... It's just key to notice that this is very different from how neurotransmitters are doing their thing. Neurotransmitters are just saying, bang, you should fire. Hey, you should fire. Whereas a neuromodulator is saying, hey, I need to change the way you do things around here. Right? So that's the idea uh, of the idea that there are two kinds of things happening that jump between neural cells. There's neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. So some chemicals will act exclusively as one or the other, but some will kind of bridge the gap depending on which neurons they're hitting and where in the brain they are and this kind of stuff. So one, one cell's neurotransmitter may be another cell's neuromodulator. Um, and they, they play multiple roles in different synapses that all depends on, on what, what area of the brain is doing. I hope this is impressing on you how what, si what starts as a very simple thing information moves from one cell to another, we add on layer after layer of complexity. So what starts as a very simple action that we've described it in its most reduced form is this binary like firing or not, right? Is this cell on or off? One cell to one cell. That's like our, our basic toy model. I want to impress upon you that there is the, the complexity of the information that we're able to, to process or represent in cells becomes more and more complex with each layer we've added here. So we've added the idea of quantity. How fast is the firing rate of this cell? That's able to be represented here. Um, the idea of many to one and one to many connections makes it so that these cells can be connected in a lot of ways that aren't just straightforward especially when you add the idea that there's inhibitory and excitatory connections between every given cell. So say you can combine cells to do all kinds of crazy stuff like, um, like neural network modeling type things. Now that that's where it stops because then, then we get into the point of long or sort of temporarily altering sensitivities and thresholds. So we can change the function of cells based on the activity of other cells. Further, that gets more complex when the fact that neurotransmitters from one cell that are firing and being released might affect the neuromodulation of other cells in, in the region. So all this is to say, what seems like a simple single cell is able to do a lot of interesting and way more complex information maneuvering and changing and processing and transferring and all this stuff than it might seem at first because of the, the tools available to the cell. So, let's talk about some varieties of neurotransmitter and modulators um, and just sort of cover the basis of the kinds of things that exist in this realm and what they typically do in the brain. Um, primarily, just to show you that there's diversity in the function, right? It's not just one kind of neurotransmitter banging against, against the wall. Um, but also we want to talk about like prime for discussion of how they can fail in the next lecture. Uh, some interesting stuff going on there. So the first known neurotransmitter, first ever identified, was acetylcholine. Um, it's typically excitatory, uh, but can sometimes be used in an, in an inhibitory way. Basic, basic tool, right? shows up in the peripheral nervous system, so in the muscles a lot of times, where nerves are you know, telling muscles what to do. Um, 
just the most straightforward kind. Uh, that, so this is actually the, the shape uh, of the chemical bonds of, of, ac of acetylcholine. Just, you know, yeah, again, I'm not going to test you on where the uh, sodium and, and oxygen particles are. Don't worry about that. This is just to give you the impression of, hey, this little chemical floating around, it does it. It does stuff. They're, your cells are very sensitive to this particular shape. So that's a basic neurotransmitter. There's also uh, amino acids. So glutamate is a big one. This is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. So not the muscles, but up in, up in the, brain, the brain stuffs. Um, and it has two distinct modes. So it can either activate sodium uh, channels, the, so just as a neurotransmitter only, or it can activate sodium and calcium channels functioning sort of at the same time as a neurotransmitter and a neuromodulator because it's changing the way that the, you know, it's, it's adding complexity to it. Um, and it can alter the way that those, those calcium channels uh, behave. So wild, right? This is, this is a, the, the wild west of, of understanding how, hey, chemicals, are just coded to do all kinds of different things in your brain. Some other amino acids, glycine and GABA. Um, so these are the primary inhibitory neurotransmitters in the central nervous system. So both are going to operate similarly. They, they activate um, chlorine channels, again, as neurotransmitters. So these are, these are promoting the transfer of a particular kind of ion that will dampen the activity of the cell. We also have monoamine, which are primarily uh, used in, in, in a neuromodulatory capacity. These are more familiar to us, I think, because they show up in our medications that we talk about more often in daily life. So dopamine, the, re the reward drug, serotonin, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, though, these are the, these are the uh, pieces that make, essentially make adrenaline function. Uh, things that we need to be able to change parts of our system to be able to respond in different ways. So these are complex, uh, and the mechanisms aren't super well known. Uh, we've been studying this for years and years and years, but it's still hard to pin down how exactly these chemicals work at the cellular level. What we do know is how they affect behavior. So lower level processes are, are affected by these kinds of, of amines, monoamines. Um, so motor learning can be affected if you have, say, a lack of these. Uh, fight or flight things, so, so that's the, the sort of the, the adrenaline type stuff, norepinephrine. Um, higher level processes like emotion and mood regulation. So we've, a lot of medicines that you encounter for, for mental health are related to dopamine and serotonin. The ways that we have maybe too much of that happening or too little, that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, so that's, that's a list, um, just a, a kind of wet the whistle for, for when we talk next week about, or next time, about um, some of the details of how these things can go awry. Um, so, neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. We see this extra layer of complexity added to the whole system um, from, from our, just our uh, action potential stuff. So it's both short-term signal transmission so just, hey, do the, do the thing, do the thing from neurotransmitters and longer term cell modulation from neuromodulators. So, um, and neurotransmitters, as what we would call them together, they, they are gonna affect different neuron populations in different ways, sometimes as a transmitter and sometimes as a modulator. Here's a, just to, I like to show diagrams from other disciplines. I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a neuron researcher, uh, but just to show what all is happening, you know, uh, I, again, I am not going to test you on this diagram, but these are all of the notable features. And we see kind of how all these moving parts move in a little bit of a symphony to show how information can move from one cell to the next. Here also, we see a sort of artistic rendering of a more sort of a higher fidelity situation. So we see 
presynaptic neuron on the left. It's got its vesicles. It's going to dump the neurotransmitter out there. We see what's often missing in the descriptions of synapses is uh, we see some of that glial material, some of the supporting network material, the, the meshy, mushy stuff between cells. So it's not just a big empty gap, right? There's stuff in there, support stuff. But the neurotransmitters flow out. They, they bounce around, they move around, and they will hit the channels on the right on the next cell over the postsynaptic neuron. It's a beautiful image. We are just a bunch of organic, weird wires. And that's pretty cool. So that's the idea of signaling. Um, basics. Uh, neurons will move ions around to change their potential. Uh, an action potential, the point of no return, cascade, when there's an overwhelming charge, which opens the gates down and down and down until, um, until the terminal. And then neurotransmitters will be released into the cleft and cause changes in the cell membranes nearby, and then repeat as the signal races across the brain and body. The way you do anything is because of these, this kind of signaling. Cool. So there's an, an interesting question that I like to, to throw out here, though. It's sort of a, a reaction I have had in the past. Where's the electricity? When we talk about the brain, we talk about electrical activity, right? We can even simulate the brain neurons directly with, with probes with electrical charges in them. What, what gives? So, you know, these cells are just moving ions and proteins around. I was promised brain lightning. Where is it? And the key thing is to bring us back to the start of this. Remember what communication is about. Information not the specific form of electricity that that information takes, right? The electricity part of a neural, of neural activity is, it is there. It's in the ion flow, kind of similar to how a battery works, right? It, it's, it is using electrical differences to change the membrane, to drive the action and everything right, like that, right? And the reason when you stimulate a neuron with electricity that it, it changes it is that it's doing the exact same thing. It's changing the membrane potential and it's causing the activity, the, the channels to open and send signals further, right? So electricity plays with the same ionic charges that the cell itself does, but it's not, you know, lightning energy moving around, so, so to speak. And the reason it doesn't matter that I want to impress upon you is that the energy doesn't matter, that the form the energy takes doesn't matter because the only important part is that information is moving. So change is key. As long as the cell can change something and tell the next cell that it's changing, then that's the communication of information, electricity or, or not, right? So ultimately, transmitting information is transmitting information, regardless of whether we're using electricity and metal wires like a computer, ion flow and neurotransmitters like a neuron or pneumatic tubes and bottles of water. I want to introduce you to a very fascinating project uh, in the Netherlands, I believe, uh, called Strandbeesten. These are translates to beach beasts. They are artificial animals. And what they do is they catch wind in their sails and convert it to mechanical energy, sort of like food. They trap that energy in bottles, essentially pneumatic tubes with seals that are able to be, you know, stored. And a clever pit is that they can detect water based on the pressure that, that it senses, quote, senses at the base, triggering the system to fully reverse its action and avoid marching into the sea. This is a strand beast moving. They're creepy, but interesting and fascinatingly designed. I actually recommend you just go look this guy up. Um, Theo Jensen. So we're actually going to watch uh, a little video just showing some of the different beasties he's made.
So, what do we make of these? Fascinating critters. Not a bit of metal on them. Well, there may be some like things of fixing the joints together, right? But they are wood, reeds, wind, sails, bottles to store things, pumps. And there's not a bit of electricity. Nothing biological apart from the wood. Are they clever though? I wouldn't really call them clever or sophisticated in the, you know, the mental sense, the, the brain sense, the neurological sense, right? Theo is, for sure. But the beasts themselves, they're not writing papers or doing math. But they are using signals because they demonstrate how this series of tubes containing air and water can be arranged to produce action in response to the conditions of the world. It can use information like, is this pressure too high such that it blows a gasket, such that it changes the whole way I work, right? So am I in the water or am I not in the water? If I am in the water, I'm going to, something in my system will change because one piece will affect the next piece, will affect the next piece until I am in a fully different state. There's no biology, no electricity, but they do a decent job marching along the beach without getting drowned in it. So, curious creatures. And what the reason I bring this up is that we've been covering the hardware, right? The wires of how the brain does what it does. And you can draw easily draw parallels to how a computer does what it does, right? Still sending signals. It might do it in a fully different way, but it sends signals and it reacts to them and it changes them, just like neurons can, you know, metal wires versus biological neurons. But just to show that there is, there are other, it doesn't matter so much. As long as information is moving some way or another, it works. So this is the concept of multiple realizability. Um, so the, the basic units of thought and action and change and even just processing in, in general in the world can all be boiled down to this idea of information and that anything capable of catching information signals, changing them, combining them and reacting to them has the potential to be a fairly sophisticated entity. Now, I'm not saying it would be easy to build a strand beast with a fully functional brain, but you can see how you could start to do that, I think. And that's it. Final thought? Consider neurons biological processes, computers electrical circuits, and strand beastons pneumatic tubes. What are other ways you might have seen information captured, changed, processed, and returned to the world? All right. Thanks. Take care.